There we go. Good evening and welcome to our third lesson in our Daniel study, um, Hope for the Faithful. We are back and this week we are in chapter two, the story of the king's dream. So let's review what we talked about last lesson, especially since it's been two weeks. Um, and let's look at chapter one and think about how did the first few verses of Daniel set up the story for us? It talks about when and where it took place. It gives you the, the background scene. Yeah, we have some chronology. We have some locations. So we get, he, he's um, there and Shinar, which is uh, some, some of your translations don't translate that. And they'll put it in a footnote instead. But Shinar is the same place as the Tower of Babel. So we know that we are in the location where the Tower of Babel took place. And in fact, that word Babel is the same word as Babylon. So we're back in. Um, so if we see echoes of the Babel Tower of Babel story, that's why. Um, second, uh, the time. You know, it was this is the time when the exiles came, um, were taken from Judah and Jerusalem to um, Babylon. And um, we see they're under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, what do we think about Nebuchadnezzar? What do we know about him? Well, he being the king of the world only wants the best and brightest around himself. Yeah, he really set himself up with a lot of little signs of importance, right? He wants only the best. He only takes the best from exile. And then he wants uh, young men who are handsome and without defect, just like without defect is that phrase that we would have seen in sacrifices that are presented to God or priests that stand before God. And so we get this, this idea that maybe he's setting himself up on the same plane as God. And so, you know, we have some little triggers to, to take note of, watch out for how does Nebuchadnezzar behave. The other factors we saw that he took the vessels from the house of God and brought them to the house of his God into the treasury house of his God. So we have that little, um, you know, there's a head to head kind of I feeling to that. Um, and then we saw that the young men, Daniel and his three friends, they accept a lot of the training. You know, they've got the three year indoctrination program where they're supposed to take on all the stuff of the Babylonians. What kind of things were they supposed to take on from Babylonia? Language, history, culture, foods, but that's well, one that they declined. Right. What were you going to say, Erin? Clothing, <laughs> dress. White. Yeah, we see later they take on the dress of Babel. Um, they uh, take the literature, you know, that you, you mentioned culture. A lot of culture is in a people's literature, right? Those are the origin stories. We have origin stories that would have been um, prominent in Babylon at this time. And so they're learning the literature of the Babylonians that says, you know, our gods made the world. They did the they did it in this way. And so they're taking, they're learning all this stuff on Babylon. And they take, they're accepting the culture of Babel. They're willing to work in the government of Babylon Babylon. But the one thing they don't do is the food. Um, why not? Well, they have dietary restrictions, for one thing. Yeah, we the thing that they're not used to that food. They're used to yeah. eating healthy. Would the food, the, the food defile them? Yeah, we, it, it doesn't tell us, but we think maybe their dietary restrictions, they resolve, St. Daniel determines in his heart not to defile himself with the choice food or the delicacies of the king. So we see that they're not indulging themselves. It's not why they take on the culture of Babylon. They, they do it so that they can serve, 
but they don't compromise according to their respect for God and how that they um, revere God in this foreign land. So they somehow they, they manage to walk this line where they're actually serving Babylon and yet they are still their true loyalty is to the one true God. And so um, we see God rewarding them. We see God giving Daniel over to uh, loving kindness and mercies just so that, you know, we, the progression was that God gave Jerusalem and the Jerusalem king over to exile. And yet here with the faithfulness of Daniel and his friends, we see God giving them over to um, loving kindness and mercies. Um, and so that continues as we go into the next chapter. Before we start the next chapter, I want to talk a little bit about structure. Because when we started and introduced it, we said that the Aramaic section of the book is chapters two, and it actually starts in verse four, halfway through the verse four, and continues to the end of chapter seven. So two through seven are our Aramaic section. And this section is organized um, with a literary device called a chiasm or a chiastic structure. So that word chiasm is, comes from the Greek letter chi, which is an X, you know, which I don't, I don't know how you make a literary structure look like an X because this one looks like a V to me, you know, it looks like a greater than symbol to me, but it's, this is what it's called. And this is all over the Bible. It's in chapter level. Sometimes you see it in verse levels. Um, the book of Esther has a, is a structured like this with a chiasm. Um, the section about Solomon in the temple has a chiasm. So this is not an uncommon thing to see in um, biblical literature, um, but it's very artful. So what I'm going to do is a little share screen, um, even though none of us really love the whiteboard, but I think this is the best way to show this. Uh, let's do a wider. Okay. I pasted it in and it didn't paste my tabs. So let me add them. This is the chiasm or the chiastic structure that we see um, in chapters two through seven. So what we get is we get two A's and they're mirrored first and last. And then two B's are second and next to last and then two C's right in the middle. And we can see the parallels that happen in here. So look at chapter two. It's the king's dream. And, you know, we're doing that tonight. He dreams of four kingdoms in these terms of these metals, right? But in chapter seven, we'll see Daniel's dream, dream, also a vision of four kingdoms, and this time in the form of beasts. The symbol is beasts. So each of them have a different symbol, and yet we see this dream of four kingdoms fits in our, our, our first and last. Um, our next, you know, go in a level. Um, we get uh, the, a, a story of deliverance um, based on a refusal to worship. So in chapter three, it's deliverance from the fiery furnace because they refuse to worship, worship the king's statue. Whereas in chapter six, we get deliverance from the lion's den because of a refusal to pray to the king, a parallel to worship, right? And so we sort of see um, how those, those align with each other. And then these two middle stories are both judgment on a king stories. There's a judgment on Nebuchadnezzar and there's a judgment on Belshazzar. Now the two kings react differently to those, uh, to God's proclamation of judgment and therefore their outcome is different. And so this structure kind of highlights similarities and differences as we go. So I wanted to make you aware of it to start with. So as we progress through the chapters, we can be on the lookout for this and what, um, what this like what message the structure might be kind of pointing to any questions on this okay so um uh, this is going to be in the notes on the video and the web page so anyone you know you don't have to write this down now but it'll be there later um in case you want to refer back to it. Although once you see it, 
it's kind of easy to remember because you can go back and just look and it's divided by chapters and you can look in it then it becomes obvious before you see it i don't know i had never noticed it but once it's pointed out you know it's really you can find it again okay so would someone read daniel chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> since everybody else is still muted. <laughs> Would you mind, Chris? In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This okay. may be Okay. Was there more? Uh, you said through 13? Yes, please go ahead. I'm sorry. That was through 11. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Thank you. Okay. So um, when does this happen? And how do we make sense of that? Did you say when does this happen? Uh-huh. It happens after they've been there a while. And obviously Daniel and his friends have become part of the sorcerers or whatever cult part they were put into. You know, there are enough of the sorcerers that they're going to get executed with the sorcerers, but are they in the group that gets called to the king to first do the interpretation thing? I mean, they may be like trainees and secondaries. They may be like trainees and secondaries. So what we get here is the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Now, this is weird, right? Because um, we're told we're, it ha it's the second year of his reign, but Nebuchadnezzar came to power and besieged Jerusalem and brought back captives and ran a three-year youth indoctrination program. So how can all of this have happened? And it's only the second year of his reign. Right. It just doesn't quite make sense. So, you know, we have an author that chose to leave this this way, you know, and we see that our author is not dumb. Right. He made this beautiful literary structure or they, you know, made this beautiful literary structure in chapters um, two through seven. So we know they have attention to detail and attention to like literary integrity there, but they've left in this two years. So it could be that um, they just didn't think that was an important detail to smooth out, you know, that they're like, well, this is how the story has been presented to us and we want to leave it this way. And really what's important is the theological points. And we are in fact going to focus on the theological points. 
or it could be implying that just to make sure you know this is happening while Daniel and his friends are still trainees. This the three year program is maybe not yet done and maybe that's what's being implied here, which would kind of make sense of the little bit of weirdness right like hey, Nebuchadnezzar calls in all these wise men and Daniel and the friends aren't there. It doesn't seem. And then the wise men are going to be executed, but he's going to get executed with the wise men. So like, is he a wise man or is he not? Well, maybe he's half wise man because maybe he's still in the training program, right? So that would uh, sort of even heighten the effect later when Daniel can do it and the, and the fully trained, you know, when the grownups can't and the trainee can, then we see even further, you know, the power of God at work in that. So that may be what's going on with that chronological note. And there's one more possibility that we're going to talk about here in a couple minutes. So um, Nebuchadnezzar, he had dreams and his mind was troubled or his spirit was troubled. What do you think about Nebuchadnezzar? What does his state of mind seem to be? It's a concern for the for his future. You know, early in his reign, we have historical records. Early in his reign, he had won decisive victories and was in a very secure position. And yet, I think Chris says it very well. He's concerned for his future or he's troubled and he can't sleep. And so, you know, he has set himself up as the greatest of the great. And yet we see just as, you know, the human state is, he, he wants to rule everyone and everything, but he cannot rule over his own mind. And so we see right away there is a weakness in Nebuchadnezzar and a dependence that maybe is greater than he wishes were there, that he would set himself up as. So what does he decide to do? What's his plan? He's going to have all the wise people tell him what his dreams are in hopes of finding good news. Yeah, yeah, he's going to feel better. And he calls in all these um, different types of wise, you know, there's there's distinctions and all these four different kinds of wise men. Um, he says, literally, he says, um, uh, I dreamed a dream and now my spirit has, this is verse three, become troubled to know the dream. Most of your translations will say my spirit has become troubled to understand the dream or to know the meaning of the dream. But literally the Hebrew there is just now my spirit has become troubled to know the dream. So it's possible that he has this nagging feeling about this dream, but he doesn't actually remember the details of what is in the dream, which might explain why he's so adamant that he's not telling the wise men what was in the dream. They have to tell him, right? He may not remember it. And there was an ancient belief at this time among um, contemporary society that um, if a man cannot remember the dream he saw, it means his God is angry with him. This is from a Babylonian omen text that was found in the, um, I think this was in the cave, Qumran, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Scrolls. Um, they have these um, texts from Babylon that are all about dreams. There were all these um, reference materials that the wise men had, so they had books, they had like dream encyclopedias to reference, right? So he calls them in and they're very confident because we know and we have texts coming from them where they had, they had like manual for interpreting dreams, you know, volume one. And so, and it was a, a thing that wise men did in those times and it was very important. Um, another ancient belief is that an untold and uninterpreted dream is dangerous to the dreamer. And so Nebuchadnezzar, these dreams are really, you know, putting him into a, a hard place, right? And so the, how do the magicians respond? Tell us your dream and we'll interpret it. Right. They want, they're like, sure, tell us what it is. We'll consult encyclopedia of dreams. Everything will be fine. 
right? They're confident that they're going to be able to do this, but because he won't tell them the dream. And you notice he makes this demand three times. So there's a structure inside this where you get this, he's reiterated it, you know, and that's three demands. And they finally conclude in verse 10, what do they decide about the king? This is a ridiculous demand that no one can answer. Right. No one else's parents makes them do this many chores. No one else's king uh, is, could possibly demand such a thing. The king isn't being reasonable. It's impossible. How, why is it impossible? Verse 11. Because only a God can show them another person's dreams and the gods don't walk among humans. Right. So the, sure, gods could do it. But the problem with the Babylonian gods is they do not live among men. There's a sense that we don't have access to their, our gods. Um, they don't even try to appeal to their gods because what would be the point? The gods don't care. They don't have that relationship. They aren't here to protect and to communicate with us. And so that sets us up, right, for the contrast of the rest of the chapter. Okay, what other story does this remind us of? Way back in Genesis. Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. So um, if you did had time to do the reading, I had you read Genesis 41 because there are so many parallels here between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and Pharaoh and Joseph, right? Um, if, if any of you read that, what, what parallels did you notice? Joseph didn't take the credit for it. Either. Neither one of them take the credit, do they? In, it's all so, up to God. What's that? It's all up to God. He's the only one who can explain dreams. God is the one who does it, right? So um, if, you, if you happen to look at 41 um, verse 1, it starts out at the end of two full years. So it could be that our in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign is kind of a, a literary parallel to intentionally cue us in that we're going to be telling a story that's parallel to the Joseph story. Because scripture does this, it, it has kind of this um, intentional design patterns that repeat, you know, and here we see a design, you know, this is the stranger in the strange land. This is the God's, God's person among the foreign, in the foreign land who only relies on God and their faithfulness. And, you know, that will carry through all the way to us as ambassadors, Christians, strangers in a strange land, ambassadors in a world that is not our own. And so we have this pattern of ex the, the, the exile in the foreign court. Um, and so it may be signaling us to look at the Joseph story. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, you notice it says he has dreams, plural, even though we only hear one dream. So that may be another parallel to Pharaoh, because Pharaoh had two dreams that Joseph interpreted, and they had the same meaning, but he interpreted both of them. Um, Pharaoh also, this same line about his spirit was troubled, is exactly repeated in the in the Pharaoh story. They're, they're exactly the same phrase, his spirit was troubled. And Pharaoh also summoned all these magicians and courts uh, and sages to court for interpretation. And just like here, they weren't able to interpret. Now, when Pharaoh um, says interpret it and they can't, Pharaoh's like, well, that's a bummer. I really want to know my dream. What is Nebuchadnezzar like? He's going to kill everybody. Kill everybody, right? He's so angry and furious. He's not just angry. He's angry and furious. Um, he's so angry and very furious that he's going to kill them all. And so there's a contrast here, right? Nebuchadnezzar is more demanding. He's made the challenge greater and he's more of a despot. You know, he's going to kill everybody. So um, we see like the contrast sort of highlights Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance and unreasonableness. Okay, questions or comments on that? Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance and unreasonableness comes through throughout. 
<laughs> yes. Because he seems yes. to like to kill people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I feel like um, depending on your familiarity with these stories from the children's perspective, from a children's um, Bible storybook perspective, uh, I think um, maybe we play down uh, how ruthless and ugly these um, some elements of this story are because, you know, they're children. <laughs> and so if those are our first um, exposure to this story, I think it's like, uh-huh, and they're going to kill everybody. And, and we just, you know, we kind of um, don't think how um how fraught this would be how you know for those of us in austin um you know we're facing an ice storm tonight and we have ice storms from time to time but because last year we had a severe ice storm and we lost power and we lost water you know like it's like the whole city has the traumatic um you know, stress, PTSD disorder from it. Yeah, it's the PTSD, the entire city is like, it's gonna freeze, fill up your bathtubs with water, you know, and to be honest, like, we're doing some of it too, because we don't trust what could happen. And I think like, Daniel and his friends, like, to just haul everybody off to the executioner, because they can't tell you what you dreamed is living in a crazy land that's living in a situation where your life is hanging by a thread constantly and it must have been you know extremely damaging conditions to live under thoughts anyone comments Okay, so yeah, and and I think you're right, Chris. I do think Nebuchadnezzar's um, unreasonableness comes through without. Sometimes I think I skip over it and just don't think about how painful it must have been and really deeply dangerous, you know, because our heroes, um, God keeps rescuing them. It doesn't mean they're in any less real danger this whole time. It must have been just so wrenching constantly. So um, like you know, people have lived in wars and in exiles and in captivity um, throughout the centuries. So let's look at 14 through 30. I'm going to, um, well, just can someone read this middle section? Can I get a reader. You can read it if I can find 14. It's kind of in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. It starts <laughs> with Arioch. Uh, mine doesn't. Then Daniel had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Oh, yeah. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. <clears throat> and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation of the king. I'm sorry, how far am I going? 30. Thank you. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah as companions and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning the, this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with, with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of, that, of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells within him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went into Antioch, sorry, went into Arioch, 
whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said to, thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known the king to the king the interpretation. The, the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and, in, seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery of the king, the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream, the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be but as for me this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that i have more than all the living but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind thank you Okay, so we start out with Arioch. He's, um, my translation calls him the commander of the king's guard, which is um, a good translation, but it's literally the king's executioner. Um, it was a title that had, been, had come to mean the commander of the king's guard, but started out as executioner. So here, Arioch is actually... Um, in charge of being the executioner, right? He's headed out to round up all the wise men. Um, and notice he's looking for Daniel and his three friends. And when Daniel starts quizzing him about his harsh decree. So what does Daniel ask the king for in verse 16? Time to find out. He wants, he wants just more time, right? But look back at verse 8. What did the king accuse the wise men of? Pandering for time. Yeah, right? But, but Daniel asked for time. What's the difference? What's happening? Daniel asked for time saying, not saying we can't do that, but saying, I just need time to get it together for you. Yeah, so I, I wonder if Daniel's confidence in his God comes through, although we know that Daniel doesn't actually know if God will reveal this mystery to him or not. You know, the way he goes and asks his friends, what does he ask his friends to do? Pray for him, right, right. So he asks them to pray. It's just, it's, again, we have these sort of, this same uh, design patterns. We have the similarity to Esther when she's in the court in uh, of Xerxes saying, you know, pray for me. She has the Jews fast and pray before she risks her life going in to see the king. And so Daniel, then that makes us ask, why is Daniel allowed to go in to see the king, right? He wasn't even in the first round of magicians to get to hear the demand for the dream. And so don't we get such a sense of God's favor again here? You know, just as God had predisposed the um, chief to be favorable to Daniel before, we see again, like maybe Daniel has, um, God is making a way for him so that he's able to go in to see the king. The, it asked for king, the, you know, before the king was like, you guys are just trying to buy time. You must be conspiring against me, right? Um, we have other documents and stories from this period where kings were, uh, when they asked for interpretations, they split up their wise men because they didn't want to just have them get together and tell the king what he wants to hear, right? He's accused the wise men of conspiring, but Daniel, he grants him time and the friends pray for him. Um, we saw that God gave Daniel to um, loving kindness and mercies. And here he asked the same word, the, the friends to pray for mercies. And so they're, they're waiting for those gifts, the gifts of God to come to them. And what happens in the night? Verse 19. 
Daniel has the dream. Yeah, it's so the king had a dream and the dream is revealed. This mystery, it calls it, is revealed in a vision. Right. We sometimes we make a, a division between the first half of the book and the latter half, which there there are some you know ways that they're divided, but the latter half is all visions, and we see here already Daniel is receiving visions from God, and God is working in that way. So, um, and what's Daniel's response? How does he respond to having the the vision? Thanks God and praises him. Yeah, right. We get this beautiful um, prayer. Does your do your translations have that in verse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like a psalm, a dox. You know, if it were the news, we would call it a doxology. Um, it's a, a little a hymn of praise. Um, I was listening to a Bible teacher recently who said, whenever you come to a song, um like this in a story stop and read it at least four times because it's going to have embedded in it the themes of the passage and i find over and over that that's true right we see you know mary's everything from hannah's song before uh giving birth to samuel way back in the old testament miriam's song we have uh, mary's song you know these songs uh, when they are told give us a lot of insight into the themes of the passage so what what do you see in daniel's song That God sets up kings and takes down kings. Yes. Yeah. So that is one of the major themes of the book of Daniels, right? It's about kings and kingdoms. The vision in the last half of the chapter, is it going to be about kings and kingdoms? About how God sets them up and God brings them down. He is the one who changes the times and the seasons, right? The, the, the power to make those changes lies with God and God's sovereignty. Yeah. What else? He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Yeah, the, the wisdom, the, the wise ones, the wise ones are Daniel and his friends. When you're faithful to God, God is the one from whom wisdom comes. And that faithfulness shows up in Daniel's wisdom over and over through the the stories right yeah one more at least or you know maybe i'll have a few more god knows what's in the light and the dark yeah he reveals deep and hidden things right? He, he knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within him. And so this idea of revelation comes out over and over because that's what these visions are, right? They're the unpacking. They're taking what's in the darkness and bringing it into the light. And so the idea that revealing of mysteries will show up, you know, through the rest of our chapter and then through the book of Daniel. Absolutely. Okay. And so, um, we Daniel goes, you know, he 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 prays his prayer and then he goes to the king. Um, he says, "Keep keep keep the pause button on on the executions because I'm going to go talk to the king and I'm going to be able to tell the vision." Um, and so, what does he say to the king? What's Daniel's speech to the king like? Again, he says, "It wasn't my understanding." It was God who told me, um, which indicates that his God actually does dwell with people, does communicate with people, as opposed to the Babylonian gods. Right. They don't dwell among men, but here there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries to us on earth right the god in heaven who reveals mysteries one of our major themes right um notice in 27 through 30 that there is another little chiasm just in those verses where daniel kind of says several things and then he repeats them kind of in backwards order and if you map it out you can find it but we so that like 27 and 28 say the same things as 29 and 30 
he repeats himself, but there's a little poetry there, right? That really highlights the God in heaven that reveals mysteries. So then he begins to tell uh, questions or comments on any of that. You know, I find it interesting that he says he didn't get the dream and the interpretation because of him, but because God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know it. My God is showing favor on you here. On you, yes. And that comes out in the vision as well, that God has favored Nebuchadnezzar, right? So, yeah, and God doesn't just reveal mysteries. You know, God isn't just the God of his own people. Remember that in this time, most people believed in the uh, gods that were regional, right? A god was a god of a place and certain um, elements, and that's where the only place they had power. But God is saying, look, I yes, I'm the God of Israel, but I'm also the God over here, and I'm speaking to this king of Babylon. I want him to know, too. Yeah, so there's a kind of a universal power that's implied by that. Great point. Yeah, okay, so starting in verse 31, you looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue. Notice the number of um, adjectives we get about this statue. It's an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. And the head of the statue is pure gold, and its chest and arms are silver, and its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. So this is, it's enormous, it's dazzling, it's awe-inspiring. Um, these Colossus statues were common in the ancient Near East. Think about Colossus of Rhodes, um, the statues of ancient Egypt. Um, the historian Herodotus describes an 18-foot gold statue in Bell's Temple in Babylon. That was, that's a, in a historical source. So, and they were for propaganda. They were to claim and advertise the greatness of a king, the king's power and majesty. So we're going to keep that in mind when we read next chapter which is also about a statue um this word for statue is actually the word image it's the same word that um, shows up in the genesis account um, genesis 1 26 then god said let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion or rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. And God created man in his own image in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. So this word for image is showing up and it's also it's showing up about this statue of Kings and kingdoms right so and these parts are made in um, in precious metals in descending order right the grandeur seems to dissipate as it goes towards the ground uh, what else do you notice about the statue anything else strike you Let's read on a little bit. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Okay, struck the feet. But then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff, like the, the uh, just the very lightweight, um, coatings of the kernels of wheat, like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer when, and the wind swept them away without leaving a trace became just like that nothing garbage that you that the wind blows away from the harvest. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now we will interpret it for the king. You, O king, are king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion. Notice that word that it's combined with image and dominion in Genesis. Here it is combined image and dominion again. You have has given you dominion and power and might and glory. Things that a God might have, right? 
In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and wherever they live he has made you ruler or given you dominion over all of them. You are that head of gold. What's this use of these words telling us about God and Nebuchadnezzar? God is his creator. Yeah, God is his creator. Um, did you notice this little, he's placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Didn't that also sound like the Genesis passage we just read? And so we get this idea that um, the God of heaven who created man in his image and gave him the job of ruling over creation with God and under God's authority, that's what he's done with Nebuchadnezzar, right? He's granted him the head of gold status. He's given him dominion and power and might and glory. He's given him um, rule over the mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. So he is king based on God's gift. He's given a job that he should recognize that his dominion is in the same vein as the job God has always given humans, right? This is the human vocation to be God's image, to co-rule with God under God's authority and in God's way, right? And so that's what Nebuchadnezzar is supposed to be doing. What do we think about how, how what grade are we giving Nebuchadnezzar on doing that? Fail. <laughs> He's already setting himself up, right? The failure in the garden was, I'll go get God's wisdom independent from God. I don't want to be dependent on God. I want to have the knowledge of good and evil on my own terms, right? Nebuchadnezzar is already like he's setting himself up. He wants the temple of his own God. He wants the vessels. He wants the, the, the young men without defect, right? And we're going to see what he does in the next chapter, right? It's, it all kind of flows together. Um, so he is not co-ruling with God the way God has, would design him to do. Uh, questions or comments on that? Um, after you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there'll be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. As iron breaks all things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. And as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it himself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future or at the end of days. You could translate that either way. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. So, what do we think about these kings and kingdoms? They just keep getting more and more inferior. <laughs> they do. They do. They keep getting worse. We also have a lot of detail about that last one and not much about two and three. We know who the first one's supposed to be. Who are the others supposed to be? So this is something that um, scholars do not agree on. Um, there are different, you know, possible interpretations. Um, and I made a little chart that I'm just going to share, maybe if I can. 
Um, so can you see that? I don't know how am I? Okay. Um, I, the way it's showing up on my screen, it's behind other stuff, but if you could see it, then that's great. Um, how do I get back? Okay. So there are three possible ways to, um, interpret this. Um, one where that last kingdom is Greece. Um, so, you know, all of them, we know that it's Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is the head of gold, right? Because the interpretation says so. But then, and we have a couple of kingdoms in the middle that we don't get any detail about. And then we have a final kingdom, a human kingdom that we get a lot of detail about. And so sometimes people will say, well, this is all about Greece because Greece is, um, you know, the reign of Alexander was pure iron, Alexander the Great. And then later when you go into the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, that's a divided kingdom. And the reason they think that this is, is because some of the later visions are really focused on the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. He's probably the little horn in chapter seven. Um, and so they say like, okay, well, this is obviously the final um the final of the four human kingdoms is Greece. And if that's the case, then when we get the stone come out, come out of the mountain, oh, that ether's not supposed to be there, then we're starting to think about the Jews who rise up in this period and take back their independence. And we get that story in the Maccabees, um, which is where we get the, the Jews get the, the holiday of Hanukkah. So that is one interpretation. Another is that it's Rome and that um this so the so if you if you say it's greece then the first is media although media is really parallel with babylon and the second is persia um if you think it's rome then the first is kind of media slash persia which makes sense because sometimes in daniel it talks about the laws of the medes and the persians it kind of includes the medes in with persia because of the way that they the conquering went and then Greece is in between and then Rome con Rome conquers the known world so it fits with this kingdom destroying others and then in that case the stone come from the mountain would be Jesus born under Roman rule who creates a church that fills the world right and so that is an interpretation that many Christians have favored over the centuries because you know it's it's kind of easy to see Jesus in that symbol of a mountain isn't it the other possibility is a literary interpretation in which each one of these is not a kingdom but a king and it's a king that's going to be in these next stories this two through seven section that form the chiasm talks uh, by name about four kings and each one of these there's a king that's in charge and they are nebuchadnezzar belshazzar darius and cyrus the persian and so there are reasons that these fit very well too and in that case when what cyrus does um, for the Jews is um, allow them to go back to their land and rebuild their temple and rebuild Jerusalem. And so they come out of exile. And although it's, you know, somewhat partial because they're still under foreign rule, um, they do go back to their land. And the Jewish people are sometimes talked about as the mountain. Abraham is the mountain from which you were hewn. And the Jewish people are the rock hewn from the mountain. And so that may work as a interpretation. Excuse me. <coughs> That's a lot of talking. Okay. So three different interpretations. What do you all think about those? Questions, responses? I guess it only matters if we care if the Bible's literal. Well, and this is a symbolic vision. So how literal do we expect it to be? So, yeah, it's a good point. Um, 
I think that's why Christians have favored the Rome interpretation. I have one study Bible that actually puts these in separate paragraphs and it actually says Rome in the in the header in the Bible above the section about the iron and the iron mixed with clay, like it's given. But it is one interpretation among three um, that I know of, and maybe there are more, but I know of three. Um, but I, but yeah, I mean, it really it makes a lot of sense that it is pointing towards Rome. Um, other thoughts? I would lean towards the middle where Jesus is the stone, just because the entire Genesis, not Genesis, the entire Old Testament story is the story of the coming of Jesus. And it's, it seems to hold more merit than option A. Uh, and option C seems like, okay, Daniel's a lesser king. Is he really a lesser king? He's a better person. <laughs> oh, Darius. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so I think, you know, we can um, struggle with this and that's okay. Um, I think what we're seeing here is that maybe it's all of these in some way. Because you notice that in uh, over and over, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall and God determines when there's been enough and he's going to bring something different. You know, the cycle in Judges where the surrounding people oppress the Israelites and the Israelites cry out to God and God raises up a leader and, and brings them deliverance. It happens over and over. And the the fulfillment the best happening of all those that happens again and again and it happens when the jews get to go home from exile and it happens when the jews rise up and and regain some independence from this this terribly like horrifically um oppressive rulers in um the stages the in the centuries right before jesus and it happens um you know, now when uh, when Christians are oppressed in various places and God brings them rescue, but it happens the most and the best in Jesus, and it will happen at the end of the days completely in Jesus's coming again. And so that we see that this may point to all of that so that like God's rescue is coming. It came and it came again and it will come fully in the end. And we see that the work of God will prevail. God will bring consequences to unjust kingdoms and establish his own kingdoms. That will happen again and again throughout history. And at the end of history, it will happen completely so that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven so that we see all things under the feet of Jesus Christ. So I think that that message is um, showing us the pattern of God's work and the character of God's work that he wants to bring justice and deliverance to his people. Questions or comments, thoughts? I was noticing that all three versions end up with Jews rising up, one specific being Jesus, but all yeah. Jews. Jesus, who is the representative Israelite, and through Israel, the representative human, right? Like he is the new Adam. He's the new Israelite, but he's also the new Adam, so that he is a representative of all humanity who comes to make things right and will come again to make things right in the end. So we see, um, you know, those Nebuchadnezzar's amazed. He worships Daniel, which is a point of controversy, right? Um, uh, we know, like, he looks like, why doesn't Daniel object to getting worshipped? Um, and we know that the G ancient Jewish interpreters were uncomfortable with this because some of them have additional stories where that have Daniel objecting to worship to being worshipped. Um, but it seems here that Daniel is worshipped not 
of himself, but as a representative of God. So just as Daniel represents God so that the message comes to Nebuchadnezzar, so Daniel represents God so that Nebuchadnezzar's worship is to God. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar says, surely your God is, you know, and he gives honor to the one true God. He promotes Daniel. He gives him gifts. Daniel gets to choose good places for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and then he, you know, he remains at the court, you know, so that we, you know, we're, we sort of completed this, this story. It's a little bit self-contained here. Um, each one of these stories, Daniel is humble and faithful. Um, and so that he can be God's person to reveal this mystery and those those themes that we're going to keep seeing kings and kingdoms human kingdoms are meant to reign under the sovereign rule of God. God reveals mystery and his people remain faithful humble not self exalting. Um, but good in a way that God works through them to bring his will in the end. So that is our lesson for the tonight. Um, next week, we'll be in Daniel chapter three in the story of the fiery furnace. We switch over to Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we see their um, similar story of faithfulness. Any comments as we close? Thoughts? I have a question. Yes. Is there any thought that chapter one is kind of like a gloss over and then what we have read tonight is kind of and here is how that happened yes there's there's some so we know you know we we mentioned that these are the aramaic chapters we're into the aramaic chapters um that's done with some literary artistry like it starts out verses one through three are still in hebrew and then he says they answered in Aramaic and it switches to Aramaic there, but they weren't not speaking Aramaic before they were you know, like the people originally would have been speaking Aramaic the whole time. That's a literary device to switch us into Aramaic and then tell these Aramaic stories. So we think that this was material that came from you know, the, the oral tradition and the records kept by those people in exile at that time. And then the Hebrew is added. So that chapter one is added, you know, clearly it's meant to frame the rest of the work. Um, whenever you think it was added, it's done in a way that definitely like puts a frame on it and, and weaves the whole thing together. So yes, chapter one is like, you know, you get Daniel and the three friends all together. And then these other stories, they tend to be separate. Like, well, this one's about Daniel. That one's about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. This one's about Daniel, you know. So um, this, it's a, it's a um, encompasser, right? Did I answer your question? Uh, I think I think so. I just, you know, looking at the timeline at the beginning of chapter two versus the whole, you know, the whole timeline thing, it just struck me that maybe that's what's going on there. Yeah, I think I think it's a good point. We should always assume because um, we should always assume that the authors were smart, right? Like to go like that, they wouldn't notice that they said in the second year, even though this other stuff already, you know, like was three years long, like they this is stuff they notice, you know, so usually when these things are in there, they're meant to indicate something or they're meant to be um, make literary points, mm -hmm. you know. Like the, it's, it's being used to tag into the Joseph story or it's being, you know, something like that. Yeah. Other thoughts, questions? Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll um, turn off the recorder so that we can do our prayer time. There we go.